Good evening everyone and welcome to Monday Night Live. I'm Tanya from Tanya Krauss Horsemanship and tonight I'm coming uh, to you live as I always do every Monday night at 8pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. And that is about to change. Um, we have been talking about it over the last few weeks and we have been considering a change well, bringing the time back, um, we took the time to 8 p.m. here in Australia, um, where we go live on the East Coast, um, especially in New South Wales, we have daylight saving times. And so we actually turned the, um, we, we rolled the clock um, or rolled the show back to 8 p.m. because it was still light and we were still out with our horses and all that sort of stuff. So now that the clocks have been reset for daylight saving time, um, hello everyone, thank you for joining. I can see everyone starting to roll in. I really appreciate that. And uh, so, yeah, we did roll it um, back to 8 p.m., but now that the clocks have rolled back for daylight savings, uh, it's well and truly dark here at 7 p.m., so I think it's fine to bring the time back to 7 p.m. And some exciting news, we are going to change Monday Night Live to Wednesday Night Live. Um, it, it's something that's taken me a long time um, or it's been in my head for a while and I've been pushing through with the Monday Night Lives because that's where it started and, um, you know, I really wanted to stick with Monday Nights because I like the, you know, it's the title of the show and it's a good time and everyone's been used to it and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but unfortunately, with the nature of what I'm doing now, most of the time I'm traveling still on Mondays um, or I've traveled significantly the night before. Uh, and quite often I'm teaching courses now on, on Mondays because we're doing a lot more three-day courses that are rolling in Saturday, Sunday and Monday and even up to four and five and ten-day courses and, of course, two-week courses. So um, we're, we, we're going to go ahead and uh, and roll it back to 7 p.m. Uh, Shirley's saying it'll be 9 o'clock in New Zealand, so I'm assuming it's 10 o'clock in New Zealand now. Uh, so that's going to bring it back a little bit for you guys and uh, we're going to change it to Wednesdays as well. I'm, I'm very... Very often or I'm a lot more home on Wednesdays than I am on Mondays and uh, I think it's going to be a really good time change. So I hope that everyone who has got used to the routine, I know that there's a lot of you and I so appreciate you, um, uh, those of you that have been with us from the start. I think this is about, uh, it's probably 35 or 36 or 37 episodes of Monday Night Live now. So we're really creeping up there. It's getting close to our one year. Not not too many more episodes before we've done 52 and that'll be a full year of Monday Night Live. So uh, really exciting stuff there. Obviously, it's going to roll over to Wednesdays and that will be as of next week. Uh, hey, Eric, thanks for joining. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. And I think it's going to be a much, um, it's going to be interrupted less. Those of you, as I said, who have been with me from the start, who I appreciate so much, and I hope that you guys can roll over to Wednesdays. Uh, I think that you'll, you'll find that we will interrupt the show a lot more or a lot less than we do at the moment by moving it to Wednesday night. So uh, really looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to it being at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. So that's the new showtime. So what we're talking about tonight for Monday Night Live is self-development and how we can continue to strive and get better for our horses. And, uh, you know, this Monday Night Live was probably fairly inspired by the fact that I've just spent the last three days in Sydney for the Bowker Lectures Conference and uh, really fantastic, highly recommended conference uh, that I do recommend that anyone... Um, go to when it's next on. I'm not sure if it's a yearly conference. I understand that it is uh, um, probably every two years, I think. And uh, I'll try and find out a little bit more information about it. I was lucky enough to attend the conference because one of my um, associates friends, Jane from Balanced Tour Services was one of the speakers and uh, she was sharing the information on her page. And so that's how I was able to find out about it because I have had a lot of people comment on my post from down there saying that they didn't know about the lectures and they wish they did because they would have attended it and all that sort of thing. So um, I, I agree. I, that's the only way that I found out about it. I know that um, a lot of us here, especially in the Mid-North Coast, 
um, uh, very blessed to have Megan Matters uh, taking care of our horse's feet. And uh, Megan usually attends the Bowker lectures as well. So I'm sure that she can um, keep us all updated. And I'm sure if you put it in Google, there'll be a website or something that you can keep an eye on. Uh, but I definitely will let everybody know uh, next time that the Bowker lectures are on and uh, hope, hopefully we can get a big crew down there. So definitely this, um, Eric saying Jane's a genius. Absolutely, Eric. She's so fantastic. And, you know, I was down there and I ran into a couple of people that we know, um, uh, you know, here um, up in the mid north coast, and I was I was saying to so many how blessed we are here on the mid north coast. You know, we've got Megan Matters for for her um, her foot care, her amazing knowledge in that area of looking after our horses. We of course have Jane looking after our horses. We've got Oliver Lyu um, looking after our horses, both veterinary and dental. We've got Alan Giles who is a vet and does acupuncture and stuff as well. So us here in this mid North Coast, uh, Coffs Harbour kind of region are so blessed that we've got um, some of the, the um, arguably the best in the country, uh, people looking after our horses and we've got them right here on tap and I know that people travel to get to those people. So we are very lucky uh, to live in this part of the world. So down at this conference and I'm thinking, I of course attended because even though it was a conference and, and a lot of people probably didn't find out about it because it was targeted towards vets, um, dental practitioners, body workers and and hoof people and so i'm not sure that it was i mean you know anyone could have attended um but i noticed that on their flyer that but you know in the in the corner of the flyer it said you know let vets and dentists and and um hoof professionals and body workers and things like that know about this course because that was the nature of all the lectures they were all professionals in those areas um sharing their latest research um in regards to anatomy and dental care and hoof care and rehabilitation and how we're helping our horses um you know rehabilitate or remain strong or sound during um you know all all the work and and demands that we put on them so um it, you know really interesting course three full days of lectures uh, just unreal information coming out of there and it really got me to thinking about self-development and uh you know i've always been a huge advocate in self-development before i was uh doing horses full time i was in real estate as a profession and i did used to invest quite a bit of money um, attending real estate conferences and and um, you know attending uh, things that I could learn more about new information coming into any industry all the time and um, I think that we're in one of the greatest times of all in regards to learning more information about our horses um, and I think that it's not only that people are doing more research but i think that the general populace has access a lot more freely to that research than maybe we um have in the past unless we went actively seeking it in veterinary journals and things like that and now we've got these amazing people doing this research and sharing this research um once it's been published published in the correct journals uh the research is also coming out and being shared publicly on on forums like facebook and things like that so we are in incredible times at the moment unless it, you know 10 or 12 years ago unless you were a subscriber to a veterinary journal or something like that or knew the person doing the research uh, we didn't really get a hold of it as freely as we do now um, and now you know it's just on tap we can put any information in google or youtube or facebook and we're going to get access to all sorts of things so um you know it's one of the greatest times i think for self-development and i think it's really a good time to take a step back and reevaluate i think where we're coming from in regards to our horses and our horse learning and what i mean by that is um often what our focus on in regards to self-development or education is we will go and get a riding lesson or we will go and get some kind of training or lesson for, um, it, you know, something that the horse is doing wrong or something that we want to improve in the horse for our own agenda. So, you know, say we're a dressage rider, we'll go and get lessons to either improve our posture or, or improve our seat or improve our communication as a rider. Or we'll go to a trainer and say, I'm not getting good 20 meter circles, how can I fix that? I'm not getting good flexion, how can I fix that? 
if the horse is falling in on the circle, how can I fix that? And, um, you know, that's all fine. That's all good and well. But what I've been thinking about lately and uh, certainly, you know, as a big advocate of self-development and, of course, a provider of clinics and information and knowledge and obviously, you know, shows and YouTube videos and articles and all that sort of thing, I'm always on the lookout of what else we can do and where else we can grow our knowledge base and get information from. Um, I really feel like improving ourselves um, as a rider or going to someone to improve the horse. And I think it's so funny. I always do that when I talk about improving the horse because I think it's so arrogant for human beings to say uh, that we can go and improve our horse's, you know, trot or we can go and improve. You know, I need to teach my horse how to do a flying change or I need to teach my horse how to do this manoeuvre or I need to teach my horse how to do PR for a spin or whatever it is that we're looking for. And it's kind of funny because, you know, you don't need to teach your horse that. He knows how to do that. You actually probably need to get lessons from the horse because he's the one who already knows how to do the maneuver. What we're looking for is a way to build a communication stream to enable us to ask the horse in the in the best possible way to achieve that outcome. So I think that's you know the number one thing. Uh, we get this this um, singular focus way of thinking about I need to teach the horse. I'm the superior being. I need to get the horse to do this. Whereas if we take a step outside of that, maybe what we need to do is is educate ourselves and un understand the horse a little more and um, the way that he works and the way that um, he, he thinks, the way that his body works, the way that his physiology works, the way that his biomechanics works. And if we can start to educate ourselves on a broader spectrum, then maybe I can start to um, improve the way that I'm communicating with my horse or improve the timing of my communication and understand what's required of my horse physically in order to achieve what I what it is that I'm actually asking him to do so you know as I said these lectures over the weekend um, I was uh, you know I don't know because I don't know anyone I, I don't know everyone and I certainly um, I wouldn't sit in an arrogant space and say that I know everyone in Australia who's a trainer or a clinician um, but I spoke to a lot of people there and and uh, read a lot of name tags and got to do a lot of uh, you know, have a lot of conversations with a lot of people. And the majority of the audience at those lectures were, as I said, uh, you know, hoof care professionals, um, dentists, veterinarians, body workers, and things like that. There wasn't um, a, a huge amount, if, if it was, may have been only me, um, who was the only trainer or the only clinician in the room. And, uh, you know, some people might be sitting there thinking, well, how can you knowing more about the foot help you get my horse to spin? Or how can you knowing more about the anatomy get you to help my horse how to do a flying change? Um, and I think that the more we know about anatomy and the more that we know about the feet and the more that we can recognize um, when our horses are compromised or recognize when our horses have a physical um, inability to do something or maybe a physical um, a physical issue that may be um, hindering them in some way, then we're, we're opening a whole new, you know, we're opening a whole new spectrum of understanding and communication and, and in the long run, ease of ultimately being able to get what it is that we're after. Um, I, you know, I think that I always say that horsemanship or, or, you know, equine education or whatever it is that you want to call it is, is um, uh, you know, beautifully simple yet, um, you know, exceptionally complicated because you are dealing with an animal that we are still learning about. Um, one of the lecturers over the weekend, Sharon May Davis, most of you or a lot of you may have heard of her, um, you know, absolutely amazing um, information and research coming from Sharon in regards to anatomy and just the comparisons of our domestic horses in comparison to, um, 
you know, older um, wild horses and zebras and things like that. And the changes that have occurred um, over the last several thousand years since we've been domesticating horses and, and what's actually happened to, the, to our horses as we know them in, in modern times, um, you know, there's been huge physical changes occur in our horses and having this knowledge or and, and um, having this information allows us to understand the way that our horses move a little better and maybe understand um, why certain things are happening with our horses. And um, one of the things that struck me that Sharon said um, every time in one of her lectures, she said, you know, every time I open or dissect another um, horse or zebra or whatever it is that she's doing, uh, you know, I learn something new every time. And she said, every single time I, I do a dissection, I realize that what I know is this much. Um, and, you know, if it, those of you that have been to Sharon's lectures before would know, you know, what a mind blowing statement that is, because the, the woman is amazing in her knowledge. She absolutely has so much knowledge in regards to um, our horses and how they work and anatomy and evolution and, and all that sort of stuff. So for someone with that amount of knowledge to stand up there and say, I know this much, it kind of really hits home how much more um, there is out there for us to know and how much that information is helping us uh, when it comes to communicating with our horses. So it's kind of like, um, you know, a lot of us probably drive cars and, and don't know much about them, um, you know, don't know the where the dipstick is uh, to check the oil, but... Um, and, and some people would say, well, knowing where the dipstick is doesn't help me drive the car better. But in fact, if you knew how the car operated and you knew how the car worked, or if you understood how the vehicle worked, it would help you drive um, a better, you would be a better quality driver because knowing how that machine operates um, or, or, or the, the mechanism of that machine helps you uh, communicate even though it's a you know it's not a living breathing thing like our horses are something as simple as a vehicle um, if you knew how it worked you would drive in a different way and probably a more efficient way a more fuel efficient way and a, and a way that was putting less wear and tear on the vehicle and a way that helped the motor and all that sort of thing so that's kind of what we're looking at in regards to self-development um, and I think that what we need to do is really take a um, take a seat and and put some thought time into, um, I guess, opening our minds and thinking, you know, what areas of my horse do I need, want, would like, whatever word you want to use, what area of my horse could I use more knowledge in? And, um, you know, one of the things that we spoke about very briefly over the weekend, no one really did... Um, I talk on worming, but, uh, you know, the last time that I did any real research on something as simple as worming uh, was probably 10, maybe 15 years ago. And um, the informa that's, that's all old information now, you know, 10, 15 year old information. And it's something that's so simple like worming, you know, I got taught how to worm a horse when, when I was 12 years old, when I got my first horse, because, it, you know, it was something that was keeping them healthy. But the new information and the new research, what we what we forget, I think, sometimes, hey, mama, um, what I think we forget sometimes is that there's companies and laboratories and, uh, you know, independent people doing constant research all the time in the background to, to check on how effective our wormers are and to check on, you know, you know what dosages are, are correct and to check on this and to check on that. And so something as simple as worming is probably something that all of us could learn um, new information about, depending on when the last time it was that you actually took the time to get the latest information about worming. Um, and, you know, that's something really simple that all of us are probably going to the shop and buying a wormer and shoving it down our horse's throat every eight weeks without really giving it a second thought, uh, without really taking into consideration what we're doing because we've probably used the same, you know, mectin-based wormers or whatever, and we, you know, we think about rotation. And I was having conversations with people about rotation who, who, you know, were saying, you know, rotation's history. It's not. We're not doing that anymore. It's not at the forefront of of 
worm care for our horses. Uh, so I think that that's really fascinating is that um, the horse industry is something that it's very common or very standard to learn something and we kind of go, oh yeah, I've learned that now. I've learned how to do that now. Uh, you know, the amount of people that come to my courses and I might help them with a sitting trot, for example, that's a really big one. Uh, you know, I have people come to my courses and their sitting trot is um, uncomfortable or they're getting pain from it or it's not effective or it's not comfortable for the horse and the horse is jacking up about it or they're bouncing. And I, and I share with them a technique um, that I have developed or a way of teaching sitting trot that I have developed in, in recent times. And, uh, and they say, you know, I've been riding for 20 years and I never got taught how to sit trot like that. I was told to grip with my thighs or I was told to hold on with my knees or I was told to do this or whatever. You know, we're developing new ways to do uh, new and better, more effective ways to do things all the time. So I think that as horse people, uh, the two biggest problems that I see is that we have an attitude of, yep, I learned how to do that. I know how to do it. I don't need any more information about it. I mean, if you take an event like Equitana, huge event, massive amounts of lectures, massive amounts of um, information, lectures going on consecutively with other lectures all the time, right? You've got five different lectures to, to choose from. I can almost guarantee that if they if there was someone there that said, you know, 2018 worming, how to be effective in your worming program for your horse, most of those people at that event would go, I'm not going to learn about worming. I learned how to worm my horse when I was 12 years old. I don't need to know how to worm. That's for new people to the industry. That's for new horse owners. I don't need to do that. So that's number one, is that equestrians have a remarkable attitude of, yep, I've learned it, tick it off, give me the new, inf the next new bit of information that I need to know. And I think that that's something that really holds us up. And I think that it's something that, um, uh, you know, we get mixed messages about all the time. Um, uh, Phil shared something on Facebook today. There was a, um, a really cool... Uh, guy doing um, some amazing work on his horse and he was actually a bullfighter which I'm not into and uh, but Phil shared it because of the horsemanship and the amazing uh, way that the amazing skill that this person had on his horse and the original person that shared it said in their post oh all your horsemanship clinicians are telling you that this stuff is new and it's not new it's all old there's nothing new out there and uh, and I thought you know that's a really negative way to put it. Um, I'm certainly not a horsemanship clinician that's out there telling you that everything that I'm teaching is new, but I'm not so ignorant to believe that we haven't developed anything new in the last, you know, thousand years, hundred years, 50 years. You know, look at technology. Technology in the last decade has grown grown faster technology has advanced faster in the last decade than it had in the preceding 50 or 100 years um i was talking to a guy at a computer shop the other day he said this last 10 years we have seen advances in technology that surpass what we've seen in the past by 10 times over so you know i think it's ignorant for us to think that the information, everything that we've got is just recycled information from 200 years ago because we didn't have, um, you know, the technology that we have now in regards to radiographing or CT scanning or x-raying or um, diagnostic tools or even sedation tools or, you know, we've got all this new information and new um, knowledge that we're finding out every day every day and people are actually taking the time to do research and do studies and things like that that i think it's such an ignorant belief of ours that you know everything's old and it's just being recycled that's not true i think that that um training techniques can be old i think we're still using the same philosophies or the same principles but the information that we have now um in regards to anatomy and the way that our horses are working i, I don't think we can apply training techniques from 100 years ago because we used to apply training techniques in a in a domination submission kind of a way and they're not as effective these days because we're breeding horses bigger, faster, stronger, smarter. Every single year we've got in place breeding programs that we're making these horses 
better than they were their last generation before and better than the generation before that and better than the generation before that we're creating athletes we're creating smarter animals and and we're still trying to apply a hundred year old technique of putting a sack on their head and jumping on their back it doesn't work these days because they're not as you know dumb as they were a hundred years ago or compliant or hungry or tired or worked 12 hours a day and all of that other stuff and that's a whole nother monday night live about you know what you know where we've advanced to in terms of breeding but i think that we ne we really need to think that that um there is or we need to think about that there is new knowledge to be had there's always new information to be had we've we're, we're spending time researching things correctly and we've got a lot of evidence-based material available to us now it used to be just hearsay it used to be just um you know some old guy down the road road said to worm your horse on a full moon um, because that was when it was most effective and so everyone in the neighborhood wormed their horse on a full moon and now we've actually someone's actually taken that bit of wives tale or you know hearsay or information and they've done a study about it and they've gone okay i'm gonna go and get a control group of 10 horses and put them in a paddock and and i'm gonna put another 10 over here and i'm gonna do these ones on the full moon and i'm gonna do these ones not on the full moon and i'm gonna do egg count and i'm gonna do a fecal egg count on that and i'm gonna do a fecal egg count on them and then i'm gonna worm them i'm gonna count how many worms came out and all the rest of it so so even though we might have old information we're able to apply science and knowledge to that information so so um, I think that it's so incredibly important for us to understand that it's, um, it, you know, it's not as simple as writing anymore. It's not as simple as I want to be a better writer. I want to be a better, um, I want my horse to be a better athlete. It's about knowing more about his anatomy. It's about knowing how to, where his muscles are sitting and how they're interacting with each other and where his ribs are and, and what, what his spine's doing and what happens when he walks and what happens when he trots and what happens when he canters. Uh, you know, where's his head supposed to be? What are, what are his teeth doing? All that kind of information and and um, knowledge is available to us now, and I think that uh, we can become better writers spending half an hour sitting in front of our computer, not on Facebook. Uh, except now, this is really good. Um, you know, we can spend we can spend half an hour a night on our computer doing research or reading articles evidence-based articles and research and we can become better for our horses in that way without needing to spend more time in the paddock it's not always about spending more time in the paddock so um you know we've got a lot of uh a lot of areas available to us and i know that at my courses you know we've spoken about biomechanics we've done stuff with anatomy we've done stuff with uh, you know, Phil comes and does the equipment lecture on how the equipment works and we've got the skull and we use the, um, you know, the bridles and the stuff on the on the skull and, you, you know, we've done fitness work and we've done all that. So I think that it's, it's um, it only takes a minute for us to sit down and just be quiet for a minute and, and have a think about, well, you know, do I know what my horse's skeleton looks like underneath his skin? Do I know what his muscles look like underneath him? Do I know what his feet are doing down there and how that they're how they're um, made up? You know, what are his feet made up of? Um, they're they're finding out new information about feet. You know, can you imagine? We've got a horse here that we've been that's been domesticated for four thousand years. We've done god knows how many dissections and all that sort of stuff and we're still finding new information about their feet that's how complex this animal is so um you know and and then so you've got the horse on one side so riding technique physiology psychology how i'm going to do my training all that stuff and then you've got our side of things you know, will it help you to have a better understanding on how our bodies work, how we manage our f strength and flexibility, how we manage our balance? Do Will it help for us to go and do a yoga class once a week or do a martial arts class twice a week or, or start taking up fitness and running because, you know, if I'm fitter, I can be fitter and take care of myself for my horse. Will it help me to you know, go to anger management classes because I'm, I'm, I, I don't know how to control my anger. You know, maybe, maybe my own, um, 
personal makeup is blocking my advancement with my horse because I lose my temper too quickly or get frustrated too quickly or give up too quickly. Oh, I can't do that. You know, I think if we sit down and we look at our horse and we look at ourselves and we look at our knowledge as a um, as a blanket, as a general blanket, I think that we'll we'll notice that the blanket is a patchwork quilt, and all those patches are information and areas that we can strengthen our knowledge. Um, another thing that I noticed. It, at the Bowker lectures and certainly when I was um, recently in New Zealand and in the States is that um, people at the top of their field are incredibly um, open to information and are actively seeking information. And I think that when people get to a point where they are confident in their field and they're at a level where they're uh, okay with what they know they're more than happy to be open in regards to receiving new information and perhaps contradictory information or just inf just information in general and what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say by that um, is that what I noticed um, over the weekend is that it was very much a lecture and then there was question times and the question time was very much round table and I suppose because you've got a room full of professionals you've got vets in the room you've got um, people who are educated in a lot of areas uh, in regards to the lectures so you know the lecture isn't it's not like a teacher teaching a group of grade one students it's a teacher teaching or it's a lecturer lecturing to their peers um, and when you're in that when you're in that environment, what I noticed was, you know, someone might put their hand up to say a comment or to ask a question, and uh, the lecturers were more than happy to say, "Oh, uh, can can you send me that information? I'd like to read about that." Or, uh, "No, I haven't heard about what you're talking about. Can you get it to me? I'd like to read that." They're comfortable enough to not go into battle and refute information, they're, they're happy to say, oh, I'm keen to know more about um, my field and I'm, I'm interested to know more about what you're talking about. And I think that it's important for us to um, arrive at that place or be conscious of being at that place with our horses because I know that the horse industry can be very, um, very competitive and very... Um, uh, I don't know what the word... I'll give an example. Um, I heard someone ask someone why they would go to a clinic with someone because the clinician was still out getting, you know, uh, attending other clinics. And uh, they said, why would you go to that person if they're still learning, if they're still having to go to other clinics to learn? And I thought, what a narrow-minded... Um, approach because for a clinician to keep learning means that they're interested in continually growing their craft and continually growing their their knowledge base and that they're that, that they've come to a realization that there is constantly new information out there there's there's always going to be something new to learn there's always going to be new information there's always going to be new evidence and new research being done uh, and I don't think I, I think that it can be very dangerous going uh, on the contrary going to a clinician or going to an instructor who says I don't need to go to an instructor anymore because I you know I'm I'm at the top of my field I you know I just spent three full days in a room full of people that have been you know veterinarians for thirty years and here they are at 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 a three day conference to get new information so I think that. Um, for some reason, the horse industry has developed this ideology or this culture where, um, you know, it should be a secret that your, you know, your clinician shouldn't go to other clinics and your your instructor shouldn't get lessons from anyone because, uh, you know, why would you get lessons off someone that still needed to get lessons? And I think uh, I think we're moving beyond that culture. Uh, I know that I've had. Um, I've had multiple, multiple coaches and clinicians come to my uh, lectures, send me emails about articles that I've written, and I, you know, I do the same thing. I go to clinics all the time, uh, and I think that, um, you know, we, we always need to be conscious of 
developing ourselves and trying to improve ourselves in any way that we can. Um, what else am I going to talk about here? Oh, so back to one of the issues that I see is people not taking the time to understand how something's working. And um, as I said earlier, Phil um, often comes to my longer clinics and does an equipment talk and we've got a horse skull and we go ahead and we put everyone's bridles on it and we, you know, we really look at the movement in the mouth and where the bridle sits or where the hackamore sits and all that sort of thing. And it's always, um, it's always a really fun, interesting lesson because different people have different equipment and different people have different questions and it's a real roundtable discussion. And, you know, Phil and I are constantly learning in that discussion as well because like, you know, someone will bring a different kind of bridle or will realize that, you know, a one-eared bridle has this action and a, and a um, you know, a, a split-eared bridle has this action and a no, um, no brow band bridle has this action and a brow band bridle has this action. So you're constantly realizing that different combinations and different changes are doing different things and having different actions. Um, and I think it's not only a matter of knowing how something works, but I think it's a matter of knowing, uh, then categorizing that in what it's actually doing to the horse and the action it's having on the horse. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, for I'll take a nose band for, as an example. So a, a drop nose band that's holding the horse's mouth shut. Um, often people are recommended to go and get that device because the horse mouth is mouthy on the bit and uh, he might put his tongue over the bit or he opens his mouth all the time. So the coach goes ahead and says, put this on, it'll stop that from happening. So the issue with that is one, it's only masking like, like the, um, the mouth opening and the tongue going over the bit and the mouthiness o o over the bit is the symptom. It's not the disease. It's not the cause. So we need to go beyond that and say, what's actually causing my horse to be mouthy and put his tongue over the bit and do all that sort of stuff. And we need to treat the cause, not the symptom. So the nose band is one, the way that it works is that it's actually just masking the symptom. You're just stopping the horse from doing something that he innately wants to do. The second thing that we don't understand or that people don't realize until I point it out to them is that that action of putting a drop nose band on a horse it's a dominating tool. And so people say, oh, it's not dominating. I'm just, I just don't want him to open his mouth. But, but the way that a police officer will get um, subdue a person that they're arresting is by taking an arm and um, taking one of their arms away taking both of their arms away if they're getting handcuffs on them. The way that we will control someone, even a child, if you've got a child running to the road, you'll go ahead and grab their arm and you'll shut down, you'll shut down the whole body movement by controlling a limb. And so what's happening with the action of the nose band is you're, you're as I said, you're masking the symptoms. So you're, you're masking the cause. You're just putting a Band-Aid on it but you're controlling the horse, you're stopping the horse from doing an action. And by stopping the horse from doing an action, you're showing or proving to that horse that you can control his movement. And that's what the dominating beings do. They control movement. They control where the horse wants to go and the horse's movement. So when we think about it in that way, the nose band isn't only helping keep the mouth closed, it's actually causing the horse to be more submissive or it's forcing the horse to be more submissive because you're controlling his, um, you're controlling his entire jaw uh, and his, and you're actually stopping his ability to relax and yawn and release tension because he releases tension by opening his mouth and yawning and chewing and licking and all that sort of stuff. So without going, that's just an example. I'm not trying to do a whole, you know, Monday night live on nose bands, which I could do. But what I'm talking about is us taking the time to look at our equipment and understand not only how it works mechanically on the horse, it's action, but also understand that beyond that, what is the control action of the thing that we're doing? Okay, so what's the psychological, um, 
response in the horse going to be from having that drop nose band on or by having its head tied down or by um you know doing any other kind of things like that you know what's the psychological action and that can be it doesn't have to be a drop nose band it doesn't have to be tied downs it doesn't have to be submission via locking something down which a lot of people use those techniques um but it doesn't have to be something like that it can be chasing the horse um around and around and around and around and around pen um you're causing him to move his feet so you're dominating the horse right you're not it's not freedom when you're dominating the horse um by continually disengaging the hindquarter on the horse chasing his hind chasing his hind rolling his hind rolling his hind rolling his hind that's dominating the horse because you're moving his feet it, you, there's a there's a point where you go beyond communication and you start to go into domination all right uh, and that's just one example of multiple things um What's Lee saying? Any horse professional I consider consulting for various reasons gives me a warning bell when it starts with I've had 20 years experience with horses. <laughs> yeah, that's that's um that's pretty good. Yeah, it's um it, it's I, I and I it, that's something I see a lot of in our in in these circles. You know, like you'll see something like that on Facebook where a younger professional or a younger person will put something up, like they might put a post up or something like that, and you know you you'll you'll inevitably get someone come in and say, oh, I've been working with horses for 20 years. And you kind of go, you know, that's great. And there's there's no replacement for years in the saddle and experience in the field and all that sort of stuff. I would never take that away from someone. But it, if you've been spending 20 years doing the same thing repetitiously for 20 years and someone else has spent five years trying to learn different techniques and, and you know, um, uh, uh, break things down and understand the anatomy and, and understand how the teeth work and understand how the feet work and understand the skeletal system and understand the muscular system and understand, uh, you know, collection and understand psychology and um, physiology and all that sort of stuff, then, you know, that person with limited field experience or limited number of horses under their belt may have a broader knowledge base because, you know, they've gone out and actively sought to have that broader knowledge base. Um, you know, as I said, nothing re nothing replaces experience and, and there's nothing worse than theoretical people coming out as well and saying, you know, it's it's like a someone coming straight out of university and, and trying to go into a new role or a new job or something like that. And they're saying, well, in theory, all this works. And they've got a 20-year veteran in that role saying, well, actually, in, practic it, in practical, it doesn't work. So it's about finding a happy balance in, um, in our continual self-development and self-education uh, to, the, to the benefit of the horse. So um, as I said, you know, number one is, is all about um, probably just uh, acknowledging that there's things that we probably did learn when we first got horses, how to do simple things like worming, like their feet. Um, and, and there's been, um, and acknowledging that there's been huge advancements and, and even nutrition, you know, um, I don't know the last time that I went and, uh, or except for the weekend, of course, there were nutritional lectures there. But um, other than that, I don't remember the last time that I actively looked into nutrition um, uh, for, you know, probably, probably nearly 10 years ago. I'm going to say that there has been huge advancements in the knowledge that we have about horse nutrition in the last 10 years. And so it's important for us to continue to um learn about things that we think we already have information about and we can improve our own knowledge base as i said by sitting at the computer we've got access to amazing research um and evidence-based um research i'm not saying sit on the computer and get on facebook and and just go to you know all the different trainers or all the different people um you know writing articles and things like that uh, and i'm not saying not to do that because i'm one of those people but i'm saying that there's there's a uh, research research based and evidence based information out there that we can be we can be looking up in in vet journals online and things like that so um it's about it's not only about technique 
you know it's about the rider um physical mental spiritual it's about the horse physical mental spiritual it's about technique it's about equipment it's about knowing how things work it's about knowing anatomy it's about knowing feet it's about knowing dentistry it's about knowing physiology it's about knowing psychology it's about looking at, at ourselves and how we can develop our own um our, our own physical mental and um Tech, even our skill base our technique like how are we holding our rope where are we standing and all that so, sort of stuff so um I, I i think that the first step is probably sitting down and thinking to ourselves what area do i lack the most knowledge in um and it's you know it's nothing to be worried about it's not, you know i'm not trying to shame anyone and and i've just freely admitted a couple of areas where i'm interested in improving my knowledge um you know it's about sitting there and going when was the last time that i looked up nutrition and what's the latest information about what we should be feeding our horses you know it's really funny and one of the examples about nutrition is you know loose and hay it's kind of like eggs loose and is kind of like eggs for human beings you know one week eggs are good the next week eggs are bad and loosens kind of the same i've i've been to lectures where no loosens terrible for your horses you shouldn't feed it and then i go to another lecture no loosens great you should feed it to your horses and so on and so forth so it's about you know maybe hearing that information and then doing research into who's actually done experiments and and you know tried to or has information evidence-based information about why it's good or why it's bad or what sort of pasture my horse is on and things like that uh so as i said when we're talking about self-development uh absolutely take opportunities like the lectures and things like that like the lectures at equitana and places like that but if you do have financial restrictions in that regard you know there's plenty of books there's plenty of dvds and the internet is just a wealth of information um if you follow tanya Crafts horsemanship on facebook uh, I, I quite often post articles not only my own but other articles that i find uh interesting or knowledgeable so uh, i think it's about as i said taking that first step sitting down with a notepad and saying you know what what where do i want to improve my knowledge base this month maybe picking a different theme each month and sort of going okay well this month i'm going to work on knowing about an anatomy next month i'm going to work on nutrition next month we can you know we spent all this time i think learning as i said investing money in coaches and things for to improve our riding and improve our technique or fix our horse or get what we want out of our horse but if we understand how they work better we're going to be able to communicate with them better and be better for them and it's for me it's all about ease of communication it's all about you know being able to go out there and just roll beautifully with my horses and and communicate with them and suggest things to them that they're willing to pick up and uh, it makes my life a lot easier i'm i'm so far beyond going out there as i would have you know even as recently as as four or five years ago i would have happily walked out in the paddock and gone right i'm working 20 meter circles today because your 20 meter circles aren't good um and now i'm i'm you know in a completely different mindset where i'm looking at that 20 meter circle and i'm going well it's not the circle that the, is the worry it's the um you know front right shoulder which means it's not the front right shoulder it's the offside hind or it's the you know it's the neck or it's the pole or it's the outside rib cage or it's the inside rib cage or it's you know i i'm really starting to understand that it, it you we've got to go way back um we, we've we've got to you know look for the prequel to the actual thing that we're thinking that we need to correct like the 20 meter circle 20 meter circle's got nothing to do with the 20 meter circle you got to go way back and it's probably something to do with something that's in the offside hind hoof or something like that you know uh as an example so uh i hope that you enjoyed tonight's monday night live it's our very last monday night live all the um 
new ones Wednesdays from now on. So we'll be doing Wednesday night lives at 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Times. I will put information on my Facebook page about it and uh, and go ahead and follow the Facebook page and like the Facebook page. That's where I put up the topics and things like that. If there's anything that you'd like to see me cover in these Monday night lives, feel, please feel free to send the information over or send me a private message and I will endeavor to get it on the list and get it um, get it on the show. So thanks for watching tonight. It was a little bit different tonight's, um, tonight's talk. Just a few thoughts about our self-development and how we can be better for our horses. Hope you all have a great week and I will see you soon.